Hello, and welcome to the Methodspace Live webinar, Research Ethics in Practice, presented by Methodspace, which is sponsored by Sage Publishing. Methodspace.com is the online home of the social and behavioral science research methods community. So this one hour webinar will be recorded and archived at Methodspace for future viewing. We will be sending out a link to view it to all registered participants, even if they're not here today, uh, uh, to access and to access the recording and the slides. Well, um, the focus of this conversation today with our guests, Cheryl Poth and Natalia Chavez, centers on questions about identifying ethics issues in research and addressing them in a practical manner. The conversation will be moderated by Janet Sammons, the methods guru at Methodspace, and co-author of Publishing from Your Doctoral Research, Create and Use a Publication Strategy in the forthcoming second edition of Doing Qualitative Research Online. So let's quickly meet today's guest. Cheryl Poth is a professor of educational psychology and a faculty member at the Research Intensive Center for Applied Research and Assessment and Measurement in Education at the University of Alberta, Canada. She conducts research, teaches, and supervises graduate students in the areas of mixed methods research, program evaluation, qualitative research, classroom assessment, and health sciences education. And for Sage Publishing, which again is the parent of Method Space, Cheryl authored Little Quick Fix Research Methods and Innovation in Mixed Methods Research, a Practical Guide to Integrative Thinking with Complexity. The latter title won a 2020 Most Promising New Textbook Award from the Textbook and Academic Authors Association. And by the way, there will be a discount code, which we'll put in the chat in just a moment for when you order the book, should you decide to order the book. Natalia Reynoso Chavez is a psychologist with a master's degree in education and cultural diversity. She is the Intercultural Education Coordinator in the Intercultural Medical Study Center, or the Centro de Estudios Medicos Interculturales in Colombia, where she has been supporting participatory community uh, processes for more than 10 years, aiming to promote the cultural preservation, nature conservation, and well-being. Natalia is an independent qualitative researcher and lecturer at the medicine faculty at the Universidad de la Sabana in Bogota, Colombia. She recently contributed the chapter, Challenges of a Systemization of Experiences Study, Learning from a Displaced Victim Assistance Program During COVID-19 Emergency in Ethnic Territories in Colombia to Researching in the Age of COVID-19, Volume 1, Response and Reassessment. Now, if you have any problems with the audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the Q&A box at the right of your screen, and one of our helpful team members will get back to you ASAP. And I see a couple of people are already asking about um, uh, audio questions right now, so we'll get to you in just a moment. And then speaking of the question box, why not tell us where you're linking from by using it right now? We'd like to know. We will be answering questions from the audience in the second half of this webinar, but if you have questions, feel free to post them at any time. And if you ask a question and don't hear us address it live, uh, we will attempt to address them in writing at Method Space after the webinar. And now I'd like to Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Very happy that you are joining us, whether you're here um, with us today or watching the recording. Um, just a little um, kind of overview of what we're going to be doing. I'm going to give kind of just a, a few uh, words to, to set the context, and then we're going to um, have a panel discussion. And this, uh, I think, you know, gives us a chance to really, you know, get see the dynamic between our two panelists and uh, how the ideas of, you know, kind of apply in, in different kinds of settings. And then, um, as Michael said, we will uh, have a Q&A and we will continue that on methodspace.com. So if there are questions posed uh, in the chat area that we are not able to uh, address during the um, webinar, we will um, have some follow-up posts. So when we're designing research, we try to anticipate and prepare for potential ethical dilemmas, but of course life happens. And yes, we learned in 2020, there are all kinds of disruptions that can uh, just wreak havoc with our uh, careful plans. And so, you know, then what do we do? And, and how can we learn in advance how to handle on the unexpected while upholding our commitment to ethical research. 
how can we help students prepare uh, for these kinds of uh, real world uh, muddy uh, situations that can happen? So um, our panelists are both accomplished researchers and bring very different experiences that we can learn from. So uh, we'll look forward to their conversation. And as mentioned, if you'd like to learn more, um, they have uh, publications that uh, you have a chance to, uh, to buy or, or to uh, access through your library. So Cheryl and Natalia, take it away. Well, good morning. It is morning here in Edmonton, which is uh, on the western part of Canada. I have a light snow this morning, so if it's warm where you are, I am envious. And uh, uh, buenos dias uh, to everybody and my and my and my wonderful colleague uh, Natalia, with whom this could not be 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 possible. And of course, to to Janet and to Sage, thank you very much for having us. Uh, it has been uh, it has enabled uh, Natalia and I to have some wonderful discussions about the application. And so, um, and again, for anybody in other languages, bonjour, and uh, and 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 we're happy to have uh, folks joining us from from all over the place. We're just delighted. So we're going to get ourselves started uh, in terms of we have two questions that are going to guide our panel. Uh, one of them is going to be, how do I identify critical issues for my research? I get asked that all the time in my classes, my workshops, and, and by students. I'm just asking a little bit about that, and, and researchers, when, when we do um, discussions around what should we actually be paying attention to? And then the other one is, uh, is this idea about what are the practicalities of responding to ethical issues as they arrive? Everybody says you need to conduct ethical research, but what does that mean when things come, come into practice? And so one of the motivations um, for, for being part of the Quick Little Books and the research ethics focus was this idea that, that we have to think about research ethics as a process. We need to plan, we need to action those plans, but then we also really importantly have to have an embedded piece of being able to respond uh, to the ethical issues as they arrive. And so we look forward to talking about the theory and the practice today. Um, and and the and I'll just tell you the context of what Natalia is going to talk about has been fascinating to hear about. So I'm really excited that folks are here for the journey. All right, uh, Janet, we're ready for the next one. So let's pause for a second and just talk a little bit about what is meant by research ethics. It's this idea about you apply ethical reasoning to the planning and implementing of the research. And what you have to do is you want to make sure that you've taken into account any issues and, and mitigate the risks to protect participants, researchers, and society. So that's just a really important part of this. Now we talk about, so what this image is supposed to uh, convey is that idea of a crystal ball. So how can you know what's coming when you haven't seen it yet? And I think to our current context right now, I mean, I remember a year ago, you know, having heard a little bit about this COVID thing that was going on in different parts of the world. And then all of a sudden, you know, I really wish now I had had a crystal ball, like what's depicted here in the, in the hands. I don't think any of us had any idea about A, you know, how long it would be, how it would be impacting all of us on such a global scale. So this idea then is about, uh, that researchers can be guided by the careful planning to pay attention to changes that are going on in our research and our global context as we've learned, take actions to identify and respond in a way that meets these three guiding principles. And so today we're going to be talking about what are those three guiding principles that can help guide us. Okay, Janet. And over okay. to you, Natalia. Thank you, Cheryl. Good, good morning to everybody and thank you, Janet, for the invitation to this interesting conversation we're going to have and I'm honored to have with, with Cheryl. So first of all, understanding context, I believe, is central in this ethical reason you describe in your book, Cheryl. Uh, and in the case that we can discuss today, which is a community-based research, the context was particularly complex. I was called to develop an evaluation of the cultural approach of the psychosocial strategy on emergency settings at the Pacific region in Colombia. I live in Bogota, which is very far from the Pacific region. And this region is known for its cultural and biological diversity, but also for being one of the most affected by our internal armed conflict. The rates of individual and collective forced displacement are very high. 
also indigenous and Afro-Colombian people that have faced systematic discrimination and state abandonment in this region are being dispossessed and forced to live from their land. In this emergency setting, displaced communities are being attended by national and international uh, NGOs. One of them called me to evaluate the cultural approach of its like, social strategy so it can be more sensible to cultural issues to attend better the needs of indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities and also to prevent harm and honor the culture of these communities. So I had to work with 14 psychosocial professionals giving this service on spill. I was, as I told you, near Bogota and I couldn't travel due to COVID-19. So the contingents not only was a barrier for me to travel to the zone, but we also had national and internal, international guidelines telling us that uh, we needed to stay away from elders and midwives because they are in higher risk right now. And in the other hand, the forced displacement rates are rapidly increasing here during COVID. The last element of the context that I believe is important to take into consideration is the researcher, the kind of researcher that you are, as Janet would say. So I am a community psychologist. So I develop research guided by particular and explicit values that I can explain on the next slide. Thank you. So, um, the values in immersing community psychology research respond to the needs of the context, as I told you before. And these values mu must guide not only the goal, but the whole process, research process. In this case, the research process was guided by the values of social justice and diversity because of the, of the issue we were dealing with. So the, the, to bring this principle to life, uh, we chose cultural humility as a principle. I have been teaching and learning to be culturally humble in intercultural settings for some years at the Universidad de la Sabana. So I knew that if I wanted this so psychosocial professionals to see culture not only as a barrier in the treatment but as a source of protective factors for health and mental health, then I needed to model the and be accountable with the same principle during the research in my res relationship with them. So for that, I didn't pick a uh, traditional program evaluation. I, I picked a systematization of experiences methodology, which is a Latin American uh, participatory action research methodology, alternative to, to traditional program evaluation, which focus on collective learning and in um, implementing collective, collaborat a collaborative plan and development of the research. We can talk about that later. Go on, Shay. It was just such a wonderful uh, way of bringing to life why we need to be protecting our participants, our society, and ourselves and, and each other as researchers. So let's talk a little bit now about the three principles that guide ethical research. One of them we just touched on a little bit is that idea about respect for persons and that the respect for persons has to do with the treatment of persons and their data involved in the research process. Some of the key issues that we have to, um, to account for are things and making sure uh, and ensuring the free and informed consent. And what that means is that folks need to be free in order um, and, and give their, um, their, their consent uh, you know, to participate as a volunteer. Informed, meaning they need to know what they're being asked to do and that idea is without interference or, co or, or coercion. And that means you know, things that can get in the way or that they feel like they need to, to, to be participating. So two of the big questions I talk about in the book, which I know Natalia is going to now address, is how are you ensuring participatory is, is voluntary? And then how are you documenting consent in these areas, especially when you're working, if I can, remotely? Okay, so for that, we need to to answer to this first principle of respect we had to take into consideration the who and the how in the planning process as you put it in your book as well Cheryl so knowing that I and Santiago Castro Gomez who is another author of the of the chapter that was mentioned before 
uh, he's a dear student that worked with me as a research assistant. We could not travel, we knew that. And having in mind those values and the methodology I explained before, we decided to focus on the organizational level instead of the community level in the research and action process. So as Falkenberg and Torres point out, the systematization of experiences is a, a methodology. It is crucial to have a research team, to form a research team. So we aim to build this collaborative group with the practitioners uh, in which they were going to be not only informants for us, but also researchers, because they were the ones who knew better than us um, the who and the where. That, that means the field and the community members that we needed to reach. And we also they also knew better than us at the how, which were the, the, the more ad adequate methodologies, which communication technologies we could count or not, because in almost all of the region, there's no much internet or even um, electricity. And they were also crucial to the ethic planning because they could help us to prevent underrepresentation and to have in mind which platforms, online platforms could be more secure than others and which kind of information, sensible information we were going to share in which platforms. Um, and also where and how we could conduct these telephonic interviews that we are going to, to explain in this next slide. Okay, so um, as I was telling you before, uh, forming the research team was crucial. So the first online group was determined in order to do that. We, what we did was to explain all the methodology and the objectives and be very clear that this was not a traditional evaluation, that I was not going to evaluate their work, that uh, instead I was going to learn from them. I wanted to make visible their good practices and to facilitate the collaborative knowledge building with them. So I invited them as, as researchers and in this uh, first focus group, we were able to adjust the objectives and the methodologies. And they advised to us which actors we needed to interview later on. Then we did online interviews with practitioners to rebuild the, the history of the program. And that allowed us to identify, to collectively identify exemplar intercultural interventions they already had developed. Then we did in, uh, telephonic interviews with local agents, that is indigenous and Afro-Colombian leaders that were working with this NGO, and also government agents, because we needed to know how this strategy was ensuring their cultural safety. Then we uh, needed also to hear community members, but as I, as I told you before, we were not, uh, we, we couldn't travel. So, what we did was to train the, um, the practitioners in the most significant change technique. So they, face to face, could um, gather stories of changes that this program had given to the community. Then, when, after that, Santiago and I uh, did all the analysis of the information and we presented the results in an online discussion group with the purpose of developing member checking with them. It was very important because there we could identify that we had missed some exemplary experiences in some regions. That means we had some underrepresentation in the process. Uh, lastly, we did a final workshop uh, which had national and international parts. This final workshop was very important because we needed to achieve the benefits we were we had talked about to participants. Like we, we needed to um, make real the fact that they, their work was going to be known by the leaders of the NGO as well as the agencies that provide the funds for the job. Okay, we can go to the next slide. I you can really see how complicated here. all the different pieces were, Natalia. It's really interesting, and 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 the ways that you worked, um, you know to ensure the, the free and informed consent 
Um, did you did you document it? You know, in terms of written, were you using it the you know oral um, assent or, or or what were you using uh, in order to make sure that you knew folks were 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 participating voluntarily? Well, it has two levels. With practitioners, we sent previously the information uh, in how do you call it the information la hoja de información del participante. Yeah, 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 you're, you're, you're like consent documentation or, or something yes. else. Yes, so they could read it before and ask the questions they needed before the first online focus group. But with the participants, and they signed it and sent it to us. But with the pre but, but within the community level, we did oral an oral communication of the consent. Yes, okay. So um, what, what I believe is, what I most like about this process is that we could build in, since the beginning a safe space for dialogue and participation and we could form this research team with practitioners as experts uh, which was which is accountable with a cultural humility approach and they were crucial in the decision making process about ethical and methodological concerns. We also could share power which is very difficult for us as researchers and and it's like mandatory right now because we need organizations and communities right now to develop our current uh, research. And we could develop um, capacity building in research and in cultural humility as we train them in, with that. I believe the member checking as a continuous strategy is, was also crucial because we didn't have anonymity here. Um, everybody knew who was which pr practitioners were involved in the research process and their practices were very easily to identify because they work in particular uh, regionals. And we also uh, were able to have critical reflection on our practice. That means we didn't only identify exemplary intercultural experiences, but also some situations in which we could have done some harm due to our cultural differences and that is very important to acknowledge the mistakes that we did and to prevent them it's it, it was very important oh that's fascinating and that leads us really nicely into our next uh our, our next principle this idea uh, around as well um, respect for persons were the things that, that we've been talking about. And so you have kind of talked a fair bit about this in terms of the practice, practitioners and community members. Um, are there places that you want to add a few comments here? No, I believe the only thing I could uh, add is the, the one that is uh, signed with the next, what we didn't achieve. We couldn't achieve like um, an, a specific community informed consent, which is very important in community interventions with indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities. We, all, we do not only need the individual consent, we need the community consent. And, that, and, and we didn't achieve that, it was impossible to do that. One of the things I think was really important about, about what you did is exactly when you're talking about the different levels of, 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 of consent and actually also ensuring ongoing consent. You know that so often in planning we see that folks ask for consent at the beginning, and and you know and you and you do want to ensure that 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 folks are continuing to 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 consent, uh, and I think that that was a really important uh, and interesting thing about especially how when you have a long a longer study with with with, with many different parts to it. Yeah, I think we can go to the next one. Our second principle that we're going to talk about is the concern for welfare. And this is the idea which we've already begun to, to, to touch on around the protection of participants. You've already talked about some of the harms that you foresaw and that some of the harms that you prevented as you responded to, to kind of emerging issues. And also it's this idea about maxing the benefits of the research. I really hear, um, you know, as a community-based uh, researcher and evaluator myself as well, is around the issues of power. And you've, and you've begun to talk about that. And I think that's a really interesting part. And part of the, the, the key issues here is actually involving the protecting the privacy and confidentiality of those involved in the research. And I think this would be particularly important in communities where folks could be identified, you know, in terms of the stories that they tell or things like that. Mm -hmm. so the two questions that, uh, that, that we've talked about you addressing are, what risks, you know, do or did you anticipate for those involved in the research? And then how did you uh, protect the privacy of your research participants? Yes, thank you, Sherry. 
Okay, so again, in different levels, how did we uh, anticipate those risks? Or what, what risk did, did we anticipate? It was clear uh, that with practitioners, we, we, we were going to have some sensible information in work contexts. So we needed to be very careful on the online settings and the platforms we were going to use in the interviews with practitioners. And with community members, the higher, highest risk we had was underrepresentation due to technology, as I told you before, but also because we as researchers were not going to be able to participate in indigenous methodologies, their, their, their own ways on making knowledge and communicate also what they need and want um, that Linda Smith had described for for indigenous and non-indigenous uh, researchers. No, we couldn't do that. Um, and also some sensible information in, in work context, maybe some the, the information um, about the violent um, situations in, in which they were involved. And how did we uh, protect their privacy? Well, we planned carefully with the, with the research team, with the organization members, which online settings and, and when and and where are they going to be? For example, if, if they needed to be, for example, uh, at home and not at the office or outside when the practitioners were conducting the interviews with us. And it was very important to assure the benefits, right? Also here, uh, we, we designed there the space for socialization and also for good practice for them. Um, as I told you before too. As you were saying, in this particular context, there was no way to assure anonymity, especially with practitioners, but also we didn't want anonymity we, because the good practices needed to be acknowledged. The successful experiences wanted to be acknowledged and they were, it, it was not going to be my job, it's their job. My job is to show their job. So there's no anonymity here and also for indigenous and Afro-Colombian leaders that have their own organizations and their own voice, they want to speak for themselves. It's not me speaking for them. And the last strategy that we are sure to, to, to give the information, knowing that it's not going to be anonymous, is member checking strategy again. They, they set what information was meant to be shared. It's fascinating work, and and one of the things that I hear and that I really try to engage uh, folks in is this idea about how do you benefit, you know, uh, our participants again? How do you bring the information back, you know, to them? So it's not just benefiting as you know as as getting the practices out there, but we're actually benefiting the folks who have also participated. And so I think you've done a nice uh, discussion around, you know, the the different levels, just like you know, of benefits as well. And and so I think that that's really really helpful. Okay, Janet, I think we're ready to go to the third. And the last one is one that I don't think is talked about enough yet. And it's interesting. We seem to have some pretty good practices. And I would say this particularly when, I, when, I, when I'm involved in our research ethics board, uh, or we, even in my supervisory or in my consulting um, ideas, I ask folks, you know, what's the justification for your sample? And they're like, well, it's because they're available through here. And, and, I, and I talk about this idea about, well, then why are you only choosing there? Like, and it's okay, but we have to have this lens now, uh, and I think we always should have, on this idea about concern for justice. What we need to make sure is it refers to the need to treat people fairly, but also uh, equitably, and, and concerns all who participate in the research. And so part of this idea is who we choose to study, what voices we allow to be heard, you know, all has to do with, with the idea about, you know, sometimes inadvertently sources of bias in the researchers, participants, and in our designs. And so I think this is going to be an area of, of great growth and development. And so I'm really interested in hearing, you know, both what you did as well as what you would do differently next time as well mm -hmm. around maybe these two questions about ensuring equitable and fair participant recruitment and, and sampling and under, I mean, very difficult conditions is what you were working in and, and, and ensuring um, equitable and fair treatment of the, uh, the participants um, in your reporting. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about, about that section as well. Okay, yes. I, I have to tell you that obviously this is my favorite principle. I think
think it's amazing that you address it with this clarity. It's very important, not only for community-based research, for all research. So, of course, uh, uh, equitable and participation in the organization and community level was our main concern with Santiago Castro Gomez, as I told you. So, in the organizational level, how, how did we, your question, how did we ensure equitable and fair participant recruitment and sampling? We didn't achieve it completely, and that is part of what we would like to do better next time, because we are going to have a next time soon, thankfully. So in the organizational level, we had an open invitation for all the practitioners, and we told them about what was what were very, um, how do you say, transparent. We were very open about how what everything was what was going to happen step by step um in order to motivate them to participate and to have power about it and we also share that power explicitly so they could participate as much as they wanted in the community level we try to directly uh, reach some key indigenous and afro stakeholders that are leaders in in their community and we could speak directly with them with in telephonic interviews. But we, we couldn't reach community members directly. That was a very good work uh, uh, from the practitioners. They reached them and they did the, this most significant change technique face-to-face. -face. We, we also took in mind diverse methods to have like the information in the languages and in the kind of thought that each, each member of the of, in each level of the of the research process, but we couldn't address the the concern of underrepresentation. We have underrepresentation. We know that, and we need to be accountable to to that because we could we didn't have equitable procedures for all, as you put it, and in also in your book, there was no way that they could participate online, and we need to. To make that right in the next stage of the of the, our research we are going to focus more in practitioners training so they can reach fairly all the community members that need to be involved in this process we need to hear their voice okay so to ensure how did we ensure equitable and fair treatment on on our participants in our reporting this is my favorite part <laughs> So reflexive, we, we chose to focus on reflexive pra practices individually and collectively as a research team. And that is a key principle in cultural humility. We need to be constantly aware of our bias as researchers, of our power, power in the research process. So for instance, in the first focus group that I told you about was crucial for forming the research team. Uh, I, 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 publicly acknowledge my privilege as a researcher and I invited them to share that privilege with me and uh, th that is I told them I, I, I am meant to be an expert here and to tell what is the cultural adjustment we need to do but I don't want to do that I want to learn about your own expertise you are there in the field working every day so you know a lot more about that than, than I how about we share our expertise? I know about some stuff here, but you know a lot more about the practice. And that helped a lot to form that research team. We acknowledge and we take into account diverse sources of expertise then. As I told you before, we used a lot of trust, trustworthiness strategies like member checking, but also triangulation and peer debriefing. And the the results, the, the presentations of the result was crucial at the end of the process because that's where we were going to make sure that the benefits uh, are going to be real. So in that presentation, I was not, we did a, a final workshop, as I told you before, with international and national uh, actors of the program, but I, did, I wasn't the only one presenting the results. I presented a lot of, of, of the results, giving the credit uh, of the good experiences I was sharing, 
but there were also members of the organization presenting the results and some indigenous and Afro-Colombian um, participants that wanted to have their own voice and they needed to, ex to, to express for themselves what are their needs and wants uh, in this particular issue, how they want to make sure their culture, their culture is saved in the, inter in the intervention process. It's just fascinating, and I know you know being able to um, translate and knowledge mobilization and using different ways of disseminating information to our to our participants is something that's been you know a growing area of of being able to to share the information. Uh, I was very mindful, and, and if I can in this, I, I really don't use the word ensure lightly. And and my all my all my uh, all my colleagues will know that I say ensure is a very high standard because it's very difficult to ensure something. Mm -hmm. But I felt like you needed a stronger word than promote or encourage. I think we're past that in terms of our, our equitable and fair practices um, in this. And so I think as researchers, um, that's a standard, a high standard that we want to be moving towards. But as you talk about in practice, it's really hard. But I, I, I really appreciate and really value what you say is we did the best we could under these circumstances, but this next time we want to even, you know, do 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 better, do do differently. And 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 it, I think it's really nice to be able to, we can't always do everything if I can the absolute best way the first time, but we do need to relationship build to get in there and then we can can kind of uh, work over time. And so I think that that was a really um, interesting, if I can, takeaway message for folks who are listening. Is there anything else before we hand it back to, or, or we take um, some questions that you want to make sure that you're able to say, Natalia? No, it's okay. That was great. And so I hand it over. Uh, I'm happy to take, we are happy to take uh, questions. And I really uh, want to just uh, emphasize a few things that, that came up as, as Michael, um, you know, works through our uh, questions in the chat. I think, you know, what you've described is very specific to, you know, the cultural setting and, and the constraints that you had, not only from the setting, but from COVID. But, you know, when we spoke initially, when, when I met Natalia, I thought, wow, you know, there are a lot of things about what you're saying that really apply, you know, to research in, in many settings. And there, you know, just a couple of points I want to just emphasize. I mean, one was, you know, the issues about displacement and conflict. And I think, you know, even say within the US where I am, you know, through the era of COVID and before and economic shifts, increasingly uh, issues of displacement and conflict between polarized parts of, of our um, of our populace and, you know, as a researcher, how do you think about, you know, coming into a community that, you know, how do you become familiar to know, you know, where those boundaries are and you know, the importance of thinking about, you know, say, I mean, you were talking about the indigenous people where you are. I mean, you know, particularly with the COVID, you know, many people living in remote settings and I mean, in the U.S., Native Americans and Indigenous people have been, you know, really uh, disproportionately impacted by, you know, some of the things that, that have gone on recently. So, you know, while, again, you know, you're talking about something very specific, it's not unique. And maybe these are things, you know, that come under that broader justice category that more of us need to, to think about. And you know, again, the, the uneven access to technology, you know, as for those of us who are like, you know, the all the press about everyone being, um, you know, fatigued by online meetings, et cetera, that, you know, there are people who, who, you know, it's hard for us to fathom. There are people who don't have access to everything. So, you know, the challenges of, of uh, representation, um, you know, in, you know, in this world. So, you know, I hope that for those who are watching this, uh, can, you know, think about, well, how do these points and questions, you know, apply in, in my situation? So, Michael, what, what do we have uh, for questions in the chat? First off, I just wanted to mention that uh, we've been doing these webinars for quite some time, and this is the most activity in the question box I have ever seen. 
So a uh, quick <laughs> warning, we will, to those who have submitted questions, we will not get to them all live, but we will make an attempt to get to them e eventually. So there have been a couple though about anonymity and the, and the lack of anonymity, and then how do you, how do you get around that? So um, just let me read one of these directly. If some participants in your sample did not agree to no anonymity, therefore wanting to remain anonymous, what did you do? Do you want to go with that, Sheryl? Do you want to? Oh, please, no. please, please start, and then I'm, and I'm happy to weigh in as well. Okay. So the question is, I, I want to make sure I understand the question. The question is, what do I do if some participants want to remain anonymous, right? And you, and you almost have a combination of, 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 of both, right? I do. Yes. Thank you. Because community members that were also victims, some of them want to remain anonymous, right? Because they're in danger. Um, even if they are far away from their own territories, so we we obviously we didn't speak, didn't we, we 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 had anonymity for them in the consent in the oral consent they could choose that, but for them we didn't plan to have a non-anonymous situation. It was only for the practitioners, and it didn't happen that a, a, that a practitioner wanted to remain anonymous. They all wanted to be recognized. However, sometimes they shared information that wanted to be anon that confidential. Like, I didn't say that, okay. So in those cases, uh, when I presented those critical reflections that obviously had to do with critical reflections about the practices. So when I share them, uh, I first, I was sure that he wanted me to share that part in order to have a collective reflection about some fact, but I didn't say who uh, told me that information. And I think that the raises a really interesting point. I've certainly done a uh, uh, work as well with with very small uh, incident populations, uh, and so that is something that. Um, that uh, you know, you you really want. And there's, and there's been information shared that I think could be, um, if I could, risky for them to, you know. And so I think as well uh, on on those, you want to have those conversations with folks, just because sometimes folks aren't as aware either of one of the, some of the risks um, we're we're, mm -hmm. we're going to do. But I certainly think you can manage. Um, and remembering that it's it's very interesting that there's different levels of things uh, around. You know, if you collect data on a on a survey, it's truly anonymous because you have no um, no connection between. But actually, anonymity. You know, there are different levels of it. You know, is it that you're collecting information that you have? No, you know, you cannot connect, or is it that as a researcher you are delinking the data? Then it's actually not anonymous data. You know, and so we do want to just remind. And so the use of pseudonyms. Um, is, 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 is really helpful um, in terms of that. And I always let my participants choose their pseudonym. Uh, and, uh, and, and, then I, and then I have a file you know, separate from, 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 from the data that, that, that does create that. Um, so you do want to make sure that you, that you are using, if I can, the right descriptor around how you're actually collecting the data. So Natalia, you had mentioned at one point going to community members or community leaders uh, and sort of so, which are in essence then gatekeepers. So we have a question from Wales. Uh, what do you do in a situation where gatekeepers to specific client groups adopt a paternalistic view and do not feel it's appropriate for you to approach them to discuss possible participation in a study? I'm sorry. I'm going to have to ask you to, to do that question a little bit slowly because I didn't get it. Oh, I, uh, pardon me then. Uh, I apologize. No. Okay. What do you do in situations yeah. where gatekeepers to specific client groups adopt a paternalistic view okay. and do not feel it's appropriate for you to approach them to discuss possible participation? That's a very good question. <laughs> it is very hard um, because you're in the middle of a situation, right? You want to say something, sure. Well, I was just going to say that that I think that's where relationships and the understanding of the research come into play, uh, in my experience anyways, um, because part of the challenge is, is, again, that gatekeeper is making decisions for their community members about whether or not. And so some of it is 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 relationship and um, researchers in the past haven't always um, 
uh, respected, you know, communities in the same way as as we should now. So I do know that for me, it's it's uh, in, in my area of, of of research is that we're known as folks who do research a little bit differently, if I can. Yes. Well, in this case, it was not so hard because of the cultural humility approach I openly um, proposed to the organization. I was I was not going to be an expert. Nobody's going to be an expert on anybody. We are all going to learn about our own um, strengths and knowledge and practices, and that is what we are supposed to do also with uh, indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities if we want to make any intervention at all useful. Because if we do not, it's proven that it's not going to work. Here at Colombia, well, the indigenous movement and the Afro-Colombian organizations are very strong and well they are not going to let you have that approach as a researcher that is why they wanted to speak from the, themselves and that is why we make space in the result presentations for that it is hard you know what was harder to to understand the different expertise of the team but not in the indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities, but uh, for example, with the students, that they have their own expertise. For, for instance, Santiago is a student, he's a philosopher, an undergraduate student of psychology, and he's very good at self-reflection, and he has a lot of questions, and he was crucial in this research process. But he was not allowed to make the presentation because he was a student, right? And I, I believe it is very hard to assume cultural humility as an attitude in all of our relations, but um, we do have a, uh, a role to, to, to give with these paternalistic organizations they're talking about, um, or somebody's asking, like by trying to model cultural humility, like acknowledging our mistakes, our biases, and our privilege as researchers. And, So we have a couple questions uh, uh, coming in about COVID, but before we do that, uh, we always have the inevitable questions about tools. So um, what are some of the tools you use? And, and one of the things that specifically came in, it's uh, something that uh, Cheryl, I suspect, is the a Project Ethics Community Consensus Initiative, which is in use in um, Alberta. But um, what are some of the... Um, what are some other tools that are available that people may be, use, uh, may be using? And then also, what sort of platforms are you using for some of the work that you're doing in the field? Well, I certainly want to acknowledge, uh, you know, in terms of the different um, ways that you can uh, have your work, you know, reviewed or you can review your own work with a particular lens of ethics. So one that's very common for anybody in, within an academic institution would be many. And I know even if they don't exist now, they are being built. I know in different places in the world that I have heard about um, that you have an institutional um, uh, review board where you submit your application and it is reviewed. Uh, and there's also some wonderful uh, community-based um, review um, online um, uh, as well. And so uh, maybe that's a, a blog I could do this, this month, Janet, around with a couple mm -hmm. of those tools involved, uh, because I think that those are really exciting to see. Um, you know, and some, much of that is the researcher reflecting uh, on, on some prompts. And I think that that's really important. And then certainly there are some organizational. I know when we do research uh, here in, in, in Alberta, we go through a school board you know, review if we want to do research in schools. Um, and so, uh, and many organizations may have that. So you want to be aware as well of their time frame. Some of them only do these reviews a few times a year. So if you're trying to get access, that can be an issue. Um, but anything else, uh, Natalia, please. But we're talking about tools for, uh ethics planning or tools about the whole research, research process ethics planning only yes i was thinking but i think if you if you'd like to speak to the planning i think that i think they're they kind of go a little bit hand in hand yes but it's focused on ethics right not on the research process online so well i think i already made a lot of emphasis on it but i think think that in community-based research, which is the case, we need to plan uh, collaboratively. We need to build a research team and they need to guide us in the planning, planning process of all the details that we cannot see 
from our offices they can tell us what we should uh, take into consideration uh, this research was done as an independent as my independent research work but so i i didn't count on a board to get advice but this research team was my board they they were the ones that were guiding me through, through the process i'm just trying to um add, add a, a couple of quick points i mean you know thinking in terms of say platforms for you know looking at the stages that natalia described where you had online discussion and okay. online interviews and online okay. focus groups um two quick points i would make one would be you know what are the tools people are accustomed to using what are they comfortable with mm -hmm. so whether you use those same exact platforms or you know to find something that has the kind of features people will find familiar so they are comfortable participating but also to think about how are you you can protect the data so you know if you are using let's say for example a group in facebook you can't protect the data you don't own the data mark zuckerberg owns the data you can't protect it and you can't promise to protect it so you know if you say well my people are accustomed to that kind of interaction well you know look for a private platform that allows you to only allow entry for the people who are participating mm -hmm. and that allows you to record any interactions like the kind of recording we're doing now mm -hmm. a lot of platforms will give you a choice do you want to record it to the cloud or to your hard drive record it to your hard drive so that you can protect the data um so you know there's you know lots to think about on that and that's something we can um you know c can follow up with on on method space in um in subsequent posts so as promised there's a handful of questions and more than a handful of questions that are somehow related to covid or to the coronavirus and they're all a little bit kind of specific so I'm going to ask this one, but I'm going to broaden it. So in, from South Africa, the, our students are busily preparing for ethical clearance applications. What advice would you give for the, uh, their consideration in the current climate with the pandemic still in full swing? And what I would like you to do in addition to answering that is just what are some of the new considerations, the new ethical considerations that we didn't have or that we underplayed before COVID that we are now, that are now front and center? Mm -hmm. I think this is brilliant, and I and I don't think if I can, we're ever going back, you know, to the kinds of things. And it's actually been mm -hmm. at the forefront now uh, when I talk about research that's that's coming. I'm like, what's your, you know, I've always talked about Plan A, Plan B, and Plan C's, but it's interesting how now I'm talking about it, you know, in in kind of if we're if if you can't interact in person, if you you know already, mm -hmm. and actually putting the, those kinds of if I can plans within an, an ethics application and within actually research planning right now. Uh, and, and that's partly because all of our, our public measures are actually in a, in a shifting, and I think they might be for the next little while. Um, and, and, uh, and I think we have lots of things that are going on. I think your question about what has it brought to the forefront, I think is fascinating. Um, I think it actually has opened up, if I can, some of the opportunities for us to do research um, more, you know, with, with, with less of a, well, uh, if I can context space, you know, issue, um, uh, I think it actually broadens some things. So I think some of the, the challenges folks will have is, is feasibility of your research. I think uh, in some ways, um, and really thinking carefully about sampling and recruitment, um, when I think about, um, you know, who do you want to study, how are you going to reach them? Um, you know, I think we can now, you know, there are times where, you know, where we used to put a poster up in a, in a local organization that's still, mm -hmm. you know, you know, a viable way. Mm -hmm. But I think we want to be a little bit more mindful, and I hope maybe a little bit more um, even documenting or defending why we're doing only that, you know, versus something else. But I do say that the other thing I know I was recently talking to somebody about using a Reddit group, you know, for their for the research, and that there are limitations to that too, and about how do you sample, you know, folks? How do you know you're you're actually sampling folks who you want, you know, who meet the characteristics that you actually want to know? So that's I mean part of the issue as well with with if I can going too broad. But Natalia, please. 
So I think it's a great question because COVID has um, led us a lot of learnings. And for me, we have this huge opportunity. Like we need to do research. We need to keep our research projects going. But we need the organizations and we need the communities in order to develop them right now more than, in, more than ever. So it's like mandatory mm -hmm. that we should address the maximizing the benefits as Cheryl put it, right? We, we need to make sure <laughs> as much as we can to maximize those benefits for, for the participants and for the communities they represent. I ask my students when they give my, the projects to me the first, the first time, I always say, okay, how this research is going to benefit your participant? And they, they, they got blank, they get blank because they don't know how to answer it. And, I, and now we need to answer that question right. because otherwise with the communities and the organizations we need to develop the research um, projects are going to ask to us right and that um has a huge challenge which which is power sharing we're not used to that and we need to learn to do that and finally uh, i think that we need to plan um what kind of information we are sharing on each platform we we choose because as Cheryl also put it in, in her book, we don't need all the information, the possible information the informants are going to, to can give to us. We need specific information and we shall always only ask them what we are, what we need. But mm -hmm. in this case, we need to make sure of that because maybe some information that can be sensible cannot be shared in some platforms, but other kind of information can be sharing these platforms. I, I think, for example, in mm -hmm. yeah, WhatsApp that we're using sometimes, or um, for example, for instance, we use um, Google Sheets to make the timelines. But in, in Google, we didn't need to speak about the violent events. We only needed to rec reconstruct the history of the program. So I think that it's important to think about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I do think we were beginning to highlight some of the ethical issues around the platforms that we're collecting data on, as, as Janet talked about. And I know mm -hmm. that our institution has, has moved to, um, to us rationalizing and as well being mindful of where the data is stored. Uh, and mm -hmm. particularly with Canadian uh, privacy laws being different mm -hmm. than, than, than US and making sure that that all appears on our letters of, of, of information and consent, which I think is a really good move. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Dan, I, I, we have more questions than we will be able to get to. Um, and we are just about out of time. I have one last small question. Well, it's a big question, but um, um, if you could answer it quickly. But I want to assure those who sent in the questions, and there are so many of you, that we will be we will make an attempt to um, in the end. So what uh, does the of the researcher themselves play into your ethical considerations? And I'm thinking this question was perhaps in Colombia in particular, but in general. I mean, is this something that is something is the is the purview of the ethical culture? Is the safety of their researchers themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, I'm going to make sure I understood the question. The question is how, how, how do we think about the researcher um, safety, right? Right, the great... not the participants, but the, the, the actual researchers. That is a great question. And thank you for to whoever did it. Well, we don't think about that almost ever. And in this case, I, I was not going to be physically there, so I am not at physical risk. But you know what is happening? And I think in this COVID situation, we have to keep in mind, uh, we are at risk of burden, of researcher burden, because we need to do a lot of work, extra work, as, as teachers are doing in the online platforms, researchers as well. So I believe one answer, quick answer is, also plan your own work and um, carga, your own. I, I would call it self-care maybe. Yes, 
So plan having to account how much work you're able to um, to have your by yourself and have research assistants. Thank you, Santiago Castro Gomez again for your marvelous work. Because we don't see that there's a lot of information, a lot of planning processes in online uh, settings that we need to take into account to take care of ourselves too. So, N Natalia, do do you think that, I mean, it, in the the research that you described here, where you had to do a lot of it online because of the COVID situation, but if people were going into those communities, it seems to me that the the cultural awareness and the cultural humility piece would be very helpful, you know, to try to understand, you know, what the parameters are, you know, in that setting. I mean, I know, you know, in, when in some previous work that I've done, you know, I relied on my community partners to tell me, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, d don't leave your hotel and go strolling around yeah. after dark in this neighborhood, but it's okay to do this, it's not okay to do that, because I wouldn't know. And yeah. so, you know, to me, you know, part of that really gets to that that sense of partnership and listening, to, you know, to find out where those risks are and where perhaps engaging, you know, as you did with your study, the community partners to do some of that kind of, uh, you know, direct line, uh, you know, work, uh, you know, might might be helpful in terms of the researcher safety issues. Yes, I think that is the key point because, for instance, working um, in in zones that do not have war conflict, for for example, in the Amazon with indigenous communities, we you, we also have a lot of risk because we don't know how to um, develop in that context, like physically, mm. you don't know, you put yourself in risk mm. and in, with nature as well as in the community, you can be mm -hmm. very um, innocent about some norms that you need to address. So yes, I think you need to make those alliances strong and also to ask and to be to be teachable. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I am afraid we have run out of time. Yes. Um, Right now, I'm going to send uh, via chat to everyone that's participating the uh, link to uh, Cheryl's books and to Natalia's chapter that we, we cited earlier. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. And a special thank you, as always, to Janet Sammons and to our, our guests today, Cheryl Poth and Natalia Chavez. And in the coming days, I want to make this clear, you uh, registered participants will receive an email that includes a link to the view the entire recorded seminar and the slides. And we will attempt to, to start plowing through the, the many questions uh, and try and answer those in print. Uh, again, this will all be located at Methodspace, but you will receive an email. And please stay connected with Methodspace for information about upcoming webinars and opportunities on social and behavioral research methodologies and academic communication. And to those from around the world, I want to say thank you once again and good day. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Goodbye.